Hey, welcome back to the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We are breaking down the rhetoric out there in the world, cleaning it up, making it, making it pure and, and good and, and all things wholesome. Uh, complicated times require sophisticated techniques. So I'm trying to get people up on their game and rhetoric a little bit more. I am Dr. Dan, American rhetorician. That's me, escaped professor, jumped right out of the ivory tower. Also, late night comedy writer from Hollywood, founder of Rhetoric Warriors. Uh, I have this podcast that I bring my friends on. And right now, like I've done, I think you're number 33, Paul. No. And, uh, 29 of them have been basically middle aged white guys. No. What's up with that? I, I, apparently, that's the only people I know. I've got others, but you don't, you don't, have, a, you don't have a token black friend somewhere. Uh, you know, at this point, whoever I bring on that's not a middle-aged white guy is going to feel like a token. So I, you know, I'm caught. Oh, you mean like like Biden's cabinet right now? I'm in the vice. So we'll come back to <laughs> it. So the the uh, the podcast, I talk to comedians about their politics, and my guest today does comedy, so that's cool. Uh, I have conservatives on because I'm fascinated by it, and I often try to convert conservatives, but I'll also convert liberals. My daughter's a super liberal way, way lefty liberal. And I'm always pulling her back because millennial liberalism drives me nuts like it does for a lot of people. So, uh, and I also bring on people who have uh, persuasion experience out in the world and a certain expertise. And my guest does that uh, today as well. So, and my big claim to fame for the podcast is I have more rhetoricians on my podcast than any other podcast in the world. I think we're up to 11 rhetoricians. So, um, <laughs> my guest this week, I've known this guy for a long time. I met him through comedy, through uh, stand-up. He, uh, he's a sales guy, as I know him. Like, sells tech, semiconductors, oil field stuff. And, again, my vague knowledge of Paul is that he's Texan. He's a dude. He drives a truck. I know that because he helped me move. And uh, he has some conservative posts. Other than that, I don't know a darn thing about his politics, but I thought it'd be fun to talk to him. So, everybody, welcome uh, Paul Sontag. Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I probably class my, classify myself as a libertarian, although I've never registered for that. So it may surprise you to know that I voted libertarian almost every presidential election, almost every, uh, starting with Ross Perot, you know, he, but no guy that stole the election from uh, George H.W. Bush and gave it to Clinton. If it wasn't for Ross Perot stealing 19% of the popular vote, Clinton would have never been president. And that's Perot, a man, fact. that guy was an interesting dude. Like they've been trying to get business people into politics through some side yeah. door for a long time. They had Steve Forbes, you know, they had Ross mm -hmm. Perot and these yep. guys. And, you know, Perot, he made a splash. He was, he was quite a character. Well, you know, the reason I went for it was, hey, uh, what do lawyers know about running a, a country and running a country is like running a business. And I've been in project management and been, you know, saddled with uh, budgets. And uh, his platform was then, at the time, 19, 1992, I have a plan to pay off the then $3 trillion deficit in three years. And uh, Saturday Night Live made fun of him. Everybody poo-pooed on him because he was an outsider. And so you now well, we got... it wasn't just that. He was also a little... Yeah, he has a comic... There was a comic element to that guy. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he was, was definitely Texan. tall and he talked like, you know, a Texan. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And then so, you know, Trump is basically the second coming of him. Here's another guy that says, hey, why don't we run the country like a business? And so, you know, that's I think that's why Trump got in. You think the business aspect of the that was the rhetorical uh, thing that everybody held on to is like, I want a business guy in in the presidency. Well, um, I think what people connected with with Trump was uh, he he didn't he wasn't a politician. You know, his his whole thing about draining the swamp and all that. He, he was saying, OK, I mean, he was a very brash guy. And, you know, you cannot apologize for his personality at all. But, you know, why why did why did making America great again ever become such a horrible thing in in uh the liberal democratic society. You can tell me that. I have no idea. Well, I, didn't I think, think it's a it good question. Like what, it, but so in rhetoric, 
you always go back to a couple of their tools that you use over and over again. And one is word choice and word definition. So what does it mean? Great. That's the, the operative term and all that. So what, what does a great America look like? Like to me, you know, like people will say, Oh, Dan, you're liberal. I'm like, no, you know what I am? I'm a comedian. I want a comedian friendly country. That's my first and primary thing. So like to me, a great America is, you know, comedians get paid for, for jokes. Like we, we don't have that right now, do we? What a funny country, a, a, a comedian friendly country. No, not at all. It's you very can't, you can't, you can't tell jokes anymore, right? You're going to offend someone. You, you can't, you can tell jokes, but there's going to be bad reaction to those jokes and it's going to have yeah. horrible effects on your life. Well, if you're Dave Chappelle, you can get away with it. Well, the thing about politics, I wrote for Dennis Miller, uber conservative, you know, guy. And his entire staff was all lefty, you know, liberal, you know, writers, because almost all writers yeah. are liberals, because yeah. they want basically just a wide open creative environment. They don't want to be called out on anything. So I've been around that world. And it's really hard to do comedy down. Like Dennis Miller ran into this all the time. He was punching downward at people as opposed to punching upwards. And Chappelle's always punching up because he's always punching, you know, at white culture, the majority culture. So he can say whatever mm -hmm. he wants. But you right. can't go downward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, on that on that thread, you know, if uh, most most uh, com uh, comedic writers are liberal and they want to keep the it wide open so you can talk about anything, how do you explain how polarized a Saturday Night Live has become over the last I don't know, five, six years. It's always, it's always been a lefty show. I mean, very first season, like they were right after, you know, they'll go after any politician, but they go after right-wing politicians hard. Well, I watched uh, a real uh, Norm MacDonald doing a, you know, weekend update, like all his jokes about the Clintons and uh, OJ. And I mean, his stuff was definitely not lefty and he got away with it for a long time until... You know, they said, hey, that's too right. And then they got rid of him. But he got well, away with it for a long time. He's super acerbic. Like, he takes shots at anybody. Like, yeah. I don't know what Norman's politics are. Uh, I know him a little bit. And I really admire him as a comic. And he's just brilliant and acerbic. Like, anybody steps in his he, path, he's going to get it. He, he was the first comedian that inspired me to even want to even look into pursuing comedy. And I saw him, I think I was watching him, Comedy Central. Back when they used to have stand up on Comedy Central, you know, when I was 19 years old, yeah. now I'm 50. Yeah. You know, back, you know, back when MTV played videos. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Those days. Back when America was great. Well, there you go. So, so, so first of all, let's, let's stay on that thread. He stole that from Ronald Reagan. That was yeah. his thing. Make America yeah. great again. But somehow uh, the media got a hold of it and made that racist. You know, the way I interpret him, him, him saying make America great again is through some of his actions, like uh, canceling the NAFTA deal and replacing it with a better trade deal for Mexico and Canada, uh, going hard against China, where we've had a lopsided import export uh, fees for 20, 30 years. And, and of course, China hates him and they love Biden. And you got to ask yourself why. You know, Trump's out, Biden's in, things are going to go back the way they were. Uh, you know, he was helping to bring jobs in, or at least that was his goal. NAFTA sent jobs out. I remember seeing train car after train car come up from Mexico with uh, Ford frames on it, go into factories in Detroit because they're building or subcontracting in Mexico. And so, uh, you know, that's how I interpreted Make America Great Again. I never interpreted it as, hey, let's make it white again. But somehow that was the underlying seems to be what what uh, was attached to that meaning well i don't I think know that's how yeah that's absolutely true so let's take a look at it so one of the things too in rhetoric is you make claims right so everybody makes makes a claim and then you've got to take some time to actually look at the evidence to see whether you can support that claim or not so mm -hmm. that idea that you know um like you compared reagan's make america great and trump's make america great are were they the same like you implied that the media somehow morphed it 
into racism. But Reagan never said build a wall and keep out illegal immigrants. Like he was not oh. anti-immigrant. That was not part of his his uh, policy. You're, you're absolutely right. And I don't think Trump is anti-immigrant. He's anti-illegal immigrant. And, you know, as we're talking about the wall, Obama uh, built plenty of wall. These, these uh, child okay, well, detention... So, so I'm going to play a game with you if it's okay. So I'm going to yeah. hold you like, I don't like, le, especially logic discussions drift horribly. Yeah. You can okay. never get anything okay. done. I'm with you. I'm with so, you. So let's stay with, he did want, like, it was a clear pillar of Trump that he wanted to build a wall and slow and change sure. immigration. Partly that was to stop illegal immigration, but he also slowed down legal immigration. Like he had a problem with the way America does immigration. I, I'll agree with you on that, because he was talking about uh, 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 allowing uh, immigrants to come in based on merit, like what can they bring to the country, and that is very un-American. Okay. Yeah, we've However, never had we've never had a a, a meritocracy no, no. to let people in this country. There's a lot of people who wouldn't be here right now. You're right, including uh, my great grandfather, who was a legal immigrant through the port of Galveston and never told anybody who where he's from. So I'm a fourth generation. So should they? Yeah. So within that theory of illegal immigrants are bad, should we go and just drag you guys back out? And where would you go? Where would they throw you? Clearly, some white Nordic cult, cult country. <laughs> I, I would, I would hope Bermuda. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I mean, okay. So I think the last number I heard, and this was, you know, within the last twelve to eighteen months, you know, while uh, uh, Trump was still president, legal immigrants were 150,000 a month, but the illegal immigrants had matched that at 150,000 a month. So the point is, if you have just, you know, right now we've got a bunch of Hondurans marching towards the border, all right? Like you know, marching they, Hondurans? We have, mon yeah, we have marching Hondurans? Hondurans are marching towards the border through Mexico. Yeah, like you, I, get the sure idea, I get the image of like 10 soldiers all like, you know, with the hats and everything, but well, they're not strolling; hundreds. they're making a mad dash because Biden's president now. I mean, look, there, there's a definite cost related upon that. You know, uh, Biden's talking about giving them all the types of benefits, and of course, Americans go, "Well, what about the benefits for Americans first before we okay. try to take care?" And so, you, if you just open up the floodgates and let everybody in, and you don't have any border, you don't have a country, and then everyone's going to be poor eventually. All right, so you you took me down a nice slippery slope there, at yeah. you know, <laughs> high speed. Let everybody in. We're all poor and we have no country. Three massive, yeah. three massive claims. Nobody would want that. Nobody would want just completely open borders in America because you but, but can't a country like that. Okay. Kind of, kind of what's going on right now. Well, stay, let's stay off Biden. Let's stay on Trump because I love the Trump Reagan comparison. Okay, okay. Because Reagan is a guy who won the conservative game. Like I was, I was in uh, college when Reagan came in in 1981, and I went to college from 81 to 85. And when Reagan started, I was going to college for free. I had, you know, grants, and uh, you know, college was free, and I had some extra money to live on, and it was great. By the time he was done, two years later, I was paying like seven, eight grand a year to go to college. So that's one of my direct experiences of Reagan. He came in and and basically defunded education. He defunded education. Hmm. Well, you've got me there. I uh, definitely wasn't in 81. I was 11 learning how to drive. So <laughs> I just didn't experience that myself. But I do remember uh, working my ass out uh, off in the service industry to pay my way through college. And it was about like what you said. Yeah, it's hard. Like, I think yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm an intellectual, I'm an academic, so I, one of the things I would vote for is, you know, funded education. Like, I don't think people should have to go into massive debt to get a, a, a good education in this country. But again, the right wing and the conservatives have a different approach to it. It's like, you should pay for everything you get in this country. That's one of the conservative principles. Okay. Would you agree with that? It definitely is. It is. I'll, I, I'll explain it to you. Uh, conservatives don't want 
uh, the government to provide for them, and they don't want to pay uh, taxes for their off their hard work and earnings for people who don't want to do the same thing. You know, uh, so I mean, the problem with socialism, and that's kind of what you're talking about, free no, stuff. I don't use that word. That's not my word. Oh, okay. Don't throw that word okay. on me. Okay. All right. Well, free education. Someone's got to pay for it. All right. And sure. again, I think it was Margaret Th- Margaret Thatcher who quoted who said, "The problem with socialism is sometimes eventually you're going to run out of other people's money." Maybe I don't. Even, it depends on what you know. How you tax them? It's boiled down. Like I, I think one of the interesting things about conservatism is that it's it's a really good, straightforward rhetoric. Like it sometimes makes comparisons like that that are hard to argue against. Yes, mm-hmm. if you're giving away money, sooner or later, you're going to run out of money. Right? Yeah. And then mm-hmm. everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's logical. But that's not really the way a, a, you know, a society works. Like if you pay for everybody's education and then they go out and get better jobs and pay more taxes, then you are actually increasing your funds instead of decreasing your funds. At least that's the yeah. argument on the other side. Now, I don't know which one's true. Well, you know, there's a there's a cheap joke which is a counter that counter to that. It says, "Well, what'd you do with your free high high school education?" So, you know, if you I work for it, you obviously work for it. I mean, it took me six and a half years to get through a four and a half year degree. I took a year off from school to work full time to save up money to return to college. So when I did that, I started making straight A's. But if you you know if you give it for free. Well, Someone still has to pay for it. That's the point. So, you know, why? Um, well, is that something that if like you personally say, this one thing has always bothered me about taxes is that you don't get to say what they do with your taxes. Right. Like I would say, hey, okay, I'm paying, let's say I pay $15,000 in tax every year. I want $5,000 of that to be put towards comedy clubs. <laughs> like I want really three really good comedy clubs in every city in the country. And I want that $5,000 to go towards that. And then I'd you're be gonna, perfectly, I'd be much happier about my taxes. You, you're going to need some good lobbyists to pull that off. I, that's fine. I bet you I could sell that. I could sell that to the country. Yeah. Well, you could sell it to every professional comedian who hasn't been able to go perform for the last year. Exactly. Look what the the resource we're wasting because we waste our comedians. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but well, the other five thousand, uh, I'd be like perfectly fine for them to dump that, or the ten thousand to dump that into education, because I, you know, my family, I moved. My my father was born on a tobacco farm in Kentucky. You know, I was a first generation going to college, and it completely transformed my family. Education. How did it trans- how did it transform your family? Are you talking about your children or your uh, your people before you? Well, in some ways, both. Like my both my children are now you know in professional jobs. They've never had to live in Kentucky. I got them out <laughs> of Kentucky because of education. But I also was able you're to go back on, and like you're railing really on a flyover state now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but like I was, you know, I went back and taught and would teach my mom things. I got her to go to college later in life and she, she loved it. And that kind of education and information changes everything around you, you know? So (laughs) I would value that. I would say, yes, I'll, I'll pay extra money so people can have a really good education and not have to do what you did, which is, you know, go and work instead of getting your education. Yeah. Well, I did that because I, I didn't never want to take out a loan. And that was the culture I was taught from my family. And so when I did graduate, I was debt free and I started making money immediately. And in four years, I was making six figures. So that's a good thing instead of having to pay off, you know, a like student loan for 10 years. Yeah, I agree. But, so is that your background? Is your family conservative? Oh, yeah. Oh, they, 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 they certainly are. I'm, I think I'm much more open minded than they are. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that happens. I mean, you know, they're born in uh, the late thirties, you know? Yeah. And uh, I mean, you you know how society was back then. You, well, you're older than I am. So, you know. Yeah. Um, So yeah. I remember my grandparents driving around the city and the things that they would say. Oh, I remember my grandfather saying horrible things. Now, uh, uh, interesting enough, we had a uh, for a few years, while my mom was still working before she quit her job to be a stay-at-home mom, uh, we we had a we had a African American nanny named May, 
and she worked the night shift as a nurse and she'd get off and and come in the morning look after me and my sister for you know three or four hours until my mom got off work and she was the nicest woman in the world and she loved us so i mean you know i i don't think uh it's just, I think it's just the way society was back then. You know, they, they were raised in, in a different environment. And, you know, what was okay then is not okay now. They loved her. They trusted her to be in their house with us. So, you know, is are they racist? Nah, I think they were, I think they had some racial overtones, definitely, you know. Oh, I, I my sense. grandparents I want, were, yeah, they were backwoods, Indiana, racists. I want to make I want to make something clear about uh, what we're talking about earlier with the border situation. You know, in in junior high, I had more Hispanic or Latino friends than any other friends. Friends I'd stay with overnight, hang out with all the time. I worked in a restaurant with hardworking Mexicans, most of them illegals. I know they are they're great people. They believe in family. They're religious. No problem with them. It's just the idea of uh, skipping the naturalization process. Think about all the people who came here legally, how pissed off they are. Go speak to a Venezuelan who went through the, the naturalization process and came through legally. Uh, is, does it really help them? Does it help illegal aliens to come through illegally, hide in a safe house, stay with a cousin, not have insurance? I mean, all these things, it's, it doesn't really make it easy for them. So uh, let as many people in as possible but, uh, you know, not an overflow is, that's my point. I mean, it will take a dent in the economy. There are numbers. I, I watched a lot of documentaries. I'm not going to quote anything specifically, but there are a number, a number of kids who were born in the U.S., whose parents still live in Mexico, and every day they take them across the border, put them on a bus so they can go to school in the U.S., and then they, at night, they go home back to Mexico and live with their parents. Now, are those people paying taxes in, in the U.S. to pay for these children in school? No. What does it cost to put a child through K through 12? It's about $10,000 a year. So if you're not paying into the system, someone else is paying for it. Okay. So, you know, that that's, you know, and that goes back to my conservative values of, Pay for play. So, and yeah. of course, your opinion is give everybody free education. Did I did I say that? Did I say yeah. everybody? Y y yeah, I, you said you'd be willing to pay more so everyone could get free. Yeah, education. we'll go back to you know word choice and definitions like these are rhetoric <laughs> games. Like everybody, that doesn't mean I'm like paying for you know Honduras, the entire you know country of Honduras to be educated. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Everyone in inside the U.S. borders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably a good thing. Like you typically find that when people get educated, they become, I think, better people. Typically. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, well, okay. So you already have free education, K through twelve. But it's paid. It's taxed by the homeowners. You know, your your homeowner tax is paying for the school system. So I mean, it's being paid for already. The question is: is higher education? Is that will that be paid free? Yeah. And I can't say I can't say I really disagree with you. You know, I mean, I've, I have friends that live in other countries. I traveled to other countries on business and learned about their cultures. And you know, they go, well, "Yeah, we pay like forty percent income tax," and uh, yeah, but everything's taken care of. But, you know, they're rarely going to, you know, there's always going to be the top percent they're going to really get ahead and everybody else has a harder time at it. And also the other responses are, you know, I got to make an appointment with a doctor three months ahead of time because it's, yeah, it's paid it's for by the question. government. You know, like our understanding of socialist cultures is so limited. Like we really don't know much about them. Like that one, that's a holdover. I remember that from the 80s where like people go after the Canadian healthcare system by saying, well, you've got to have a, an appointment and you, know, you have cancer for three months before they'll even see you. That, that okay. like in rhetoric, that's a, what I would call a stain element. And these are super okay. powerful in rhetoric and they're all over the place on both sides. But that staining socialism with that particular little story has uh -huh. People for decades, and is it true? I have I have no idea. Well, the example I just gave you is firsthand information from my name William, my friend William Bonner, who lives in Edinburgh, Scotland. I went over there in 2008 to run the uh, uh, Loch Ness Marathon with him, and two days later he said, "Paul, 
I can't hang out with you today. I got to go to this doctor's appointment. I made it three months ago. If I cancel it, I won't have one until three months later. So, I mean, that's a firsthand story and I didn't make it up. No, so I don't if believe it, you made you know, it up. That's, but it's maybe, one story, maybe. right? In one well, country. yeah, okay. I mean, he, he said that's the way it is in Scotland or the UK. I mean, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's, they didn't single him out because his name is William Bonner. <laughs> No, but so the other game we play here is we look at the quality of your evidence and it's not trying to disprove your evidence because I think that's bad rhetoric. I think going around just trying to slap everybody down and prove them wrong is a bad way of doing, you know, persuasion. It's a bad way of doing communication in general. So I'm not saying that's that's untrue or that's not a valuable piece of information. It's just a tiny, tiny piece of information. Sure. So many socialist countries and there's so many different ways of doing that stuff. They, we can't really draw much of a conclusion from that that story. No, no. But it's still valuable. I mean, I'd love to hear more, you know, from people that are actually in the socialist systems about whether they like it or not, because then I can make an informed decision. Right now, I know nothing about it. My impression is they just didn't know anything different. They just, from, you know, their visits to the U.S., to Austin, you know, people I dealt with in business and in Houston, they would point out the differences, you know, as well, you know, what they thought was weird about America. And sure. you know, I'd travel over there and I go, wow, French do really eat bread and cheese with every meal. It's ridiculous. Yeah, my daughter is saying, yeah. yeah. And, and no one's fat. No one's fat because they use like four ingredients to make their bread. You know, it's right. not made, you know, it's not, it's, uh, it's not, it's uh, not GMO bread. It's not, uh, wheat isn't offered, uh, supplied by Monsanto. You know, I mean, it, it's yeah. crazy. They're all skinny. They all walk a lot. They all use mass transit. I mean, everybody, there's lots of cars. But, um, yeah, when I went to Paris, I'd walk on average six to 10 miles a day. Well, see, I well, think that it. sounds like a better way to live. Why don't we do that here? Because um, it's scorching hot and it's too far. You want to walk to Round Rock from San Marcos? Good luck. Yeah, I know. But so why don't we redo our cities? Like they're talking about going back into New York now. You know, Robert Moses, the architect in New York in the 70s, you know, basically destroyed neighborhoods and destroyed the walking nature of a lot of that parts of that city by putting in highways. And, yeah. you know, and they're talking about going in and tearing down those highways, re sort of connecting the communities and figuring out better ways to do the road system. Right. Which, well, you know, something very unique about the architecture in Paris, you know, I noticed it really well when I went up into the Eiffel Tower and looked down. Everything is like a wheel. Yeah, it's oh, really cool. Oh, I got to put my hands up here so you can see. I mean, it's a radial wheel, and it's, uh, there's all these four and five story. You know, all the apartment complexes kind of look the same, very structured, but they're all in like circles. And in the traffic circle around it, you on the first floor, you walk around. There's a butcher shop. There's a cheese shop. There's a vegetable shop. You know, whatever. And you get home from work, and you walk around and buy exactly what you need for dinner. You go upstairs and you cook it because you only have a tiny apartment and your refrigerator is this big. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, you know, I think that's a better way to live. I, and, and when I lived in downtown Austin, I lived uh, like 500 feet from Whole Foods and I would go there and get lunch almost right. every day. Yeah. And just buy what I need for the, you know, instead of letting produce go to waste. But now I'm living in San Marcos and the outskirts and you go to HEB and you load up, you know? Yeah. Well, there's the thing, too, and I think I, when I look at stuff like Trump talking about immigration and what it does to sort of reorient the way we think about other people, non-Americans, you know, in general, like to label them illegal and illegal is a very, you know, definitive distinction. And to create enough of like fear of people coming here illegally, like you talked about caravans and people marching and, you know, scrambling over the border and all that kind of stuff. It makes us afraid of other cultures versus making us look at like innovations and things we can learn from other cultures to make things here better. And that's one of the things I always loved about New York is New York has been just wave after wave after wave of immigration and they uh -huh. take the best stuff. And they just hold on to it. You know, uh -huh. all the food there is amazing. And like, you know, not that New York is perfect, but it has it, it's infused by culture. And I think that's part of the American story that like a president should really focus on as a positive as opposed to a negative. And I think Trump right. negativized it much more so even like right. I said, Reagan didn't do that. And George Bush no, first didn't no. do that. 
No, no, he didn't. But, uh, you know, car cartels are real. Coyotes are real. Uh, you know, it's, it's documented fact that, you know, they figured out our, our system of coming over the border and an adult comes with a child. It doesn't even have to be their child. They know they'll have a better chance of getting in. Yeah, there's some of that. They're going to game. Everybody's going to game everything. Right. But again, they've right. been doing that forever. Like right. the Italians and the Irish didn't come over here, you know, with who they were. They changed their names. They, they gamed the system. That's what they do. Hmm. hmm. That's something to think about. So what future would you like to see for this country? Comedian president. <laughs> are you are you nominating yourself or you're no. running? No, I don't want the job. I want uh Reagan was pretty funny. Reagan was an actor, you know, Reagan was a, a really interesting guy for the history of politics. Like he was the first guy that, you know, was just really good with script. And he was a mm -hmm. dramatic actor. And man, that guy could deliver a dramatic speech. Yeah, then, yeah, you know, yeah. Trump came along and Trump was a reality show star. And he knows how to blow yeah. it up all the time. Yeah. And that kind of entertainment stuff just overwhelmed politics. Like he took over the country. Mm -hmm. you, know, you couldn't, yeah. like yesterday with Tiger Woods, you know, has a fender bender and, you know, goes into surgery. And it's 9,000 hours of coverage because he's an entertainment figure. And Trump had the same power. Yeah. Well, he, uh, I always said his handlers could have handled him better, but I guess he just didn't listen to him. Dude, but, I you don't know, think there was any handling him. Like, yeah. I mean, him. yeah, it's like, you know, you, you, there's, you could have said that so many ways, you know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, he definitely for effect. It, they call it Trump speech. You know, everything's going to be great. It's going to be better. It's going to be wonderful. Well, he's a promoter. <laughs> I mean, he has a huge yeah. history as a promoter, and that's how promoters talk. You yeah. Know, everything is overblown, overclaimed. It's P.T. Barnum. You know, mm -hmm. and the guy had learned that for 30, 40 years in New York. So mm -hmm. he knew it. And then he knew mm -hmm. how to do TV. He knew, you know, he learned how to blow up social media. Like, he was too strong. For me, he was too strong for politics. Like, you don't want your politicians to be that entertaining. You know, it's just too much. It took, right. it took over. Right. I like boring you, Biden. I want a boring president. Well, uh, how long do you think he'll be before uh, Kamala takes over? I don't particularly find her to be interesting either. I mean, she's like, uh, she's a pretty bland character. Like uh, the one I like, you know, as far as somebody that I think is an interesting uh, character is Stacey Abrams from Georgia. You know, yeah. she's got some pop to her. I'd, I'd be uh -huh. interested to hear what, you know, she has to say about, you know, some of this stuff. Uh, but she's much more vibrant than Kamala Harris. Hmm. Kamala Harris. She needs to fix. Oh, uh, don't, 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 don't mispronounce it. They'll come after you. They can come. At, I t it's a hard name to figure out how to pronounce. Both of those are good pronunciations. And my brain won't uh, hold well, on to it. I think I think it was funny they were ragging on some conservative for mispronouncing her name. It's, it's supposed to be Kamal, I believe it. But like two Kamala. days later, Biden's huh? I think it's Kamala. And, and it's Kamala. two days later, Biden called her Kamala after he nominated her, her vice president. And like, well, how are you gonna how are you gonna be mad at somebody with the president who nominated you vice president can't say your name? Yeah, except for the you know the conservative guy was doing it you know, on purpose for effect. It was a rhetorical move, you know. I, I, I don't know. I think call her Kalamata Olive Harris is, you know, for effect. If you can make it funny, I mean, mispronouncing names is a comedy technique. It's been used a billion <laughs> times. If you can make it funny, great. But if you're doing it to deride somebody, then you've got to hold, uh, you got to take responsibility for that. You say, yes, that's why I'm doing it. Don't try to dodge me when I know that's exactly yeah. what you just did. Yeah. And that's kind yeah. of part of my thing here with the rhetoric warriors thing is I push ethical persuasion. I don't care if you're conservative. I don't care if you're liberal. I don't care what you are as long as you're doing ethical persuasion techniques. So if you say something that's derisive towards somebody else, right. then own it. Yeah. I have no I problem with derision. <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> so, 
So you came from, you're from Texas, right? Correct. Born and raised, been here, well, lived in Texas in my entire life. And now you're going to yeah. move to Colorado. That's a liberal state, man. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, and everybody else asked me, you're going to get some good weed? I mean, there's got to be something more to Colorado <laughs> than weed, and trust me, there is. No, the deal is, uh, my brother-in-law is basically a billy goat. He was raised in the woods. He's an a, a avid backpacker, and so after my sister married him, I started going on these backpacking trips, like several days carrying a 50-pound pack up and over the Continental Divide numbers of times. Oh, that's awesome. and, you, and you don't see another human for days. And that's what I like. I like trail running and, and hiking. I love Colorado. Durango's beautiful. Colorado Springs would work. That's close enough. Uh, well, I just love it. I love the scenery. I love the mountains. I love the twisty roads. I love the pine trees. And I don't like August in Texas. What? Come on. <laughs> Aren't you a lizard? Even lizards. Hey. Hey, you, you can't put enough slip and slides in the front yard to get through August in Texas. It's bad. Yeah, well, as long as it's not Siberia in, in February, I'm fine. I can deal yeah. with the melt. I can, I can, well, we just went through some cold. You know, we had four degrees here. I was feeding the, out of power, feeding the, feeding the fireplace for four days straight, <laughs> shoveling soot. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't really mind the cold. I like that. And also, I'm a pretty good snowboarder. So, yeah. Well, that's cool. I, like Colorado. Evan, I think places like Colorado and stuff like that, for people that, yeah, I get a sense, like we've talked about this, you know, you've been in sales for a long time. And, you know, anybody that's in those worlds for a certain amount of time, I just watched Death of a Salesman the other night. Um, yeah. You know, anybody's in that world for a while, you absorb it to the point where it's, it seems to be kind of hard to take you know, as just a life orientation, you know, just constant sales. And then that it, people give Hollywood this rap too. And I, I understand why, but like you can stand in the Hollywood improv having a conversation with somebody and everybody just looking over everybody's shoulder to see who else is more important that might do something for them. So the social connectivity is very different. The social, you know, interaction is very different and it's, it's different in sales too. Right. I mean, you have a different orientation to people when you're when you're going out doing sales. Well, say more about that. So different orientation. The the idea that you have to to make a living, you know, uh, get this person, help this person to a position where they'll they'll buy from you. Right. You know, and that drives that that drives the interaction. It's not the only reason you interact with people and it doesn't, you know, determine everything, but it's, it's different. Talking to somebody to sell to them is different than like us talking today to just, well, it's, yeah, it's much more different for them. Uh, to, because when I speak to people, I feel like I'm a sales uh, consultant. I'm not thinking I've got to close this deal. Uh, I hope, but I'm not worried about it. If I don't, it's kind of like, not caring if you get laid with a hot chick at the bar. You got to put and be yourself in the right mindset. It to me, talking to people in sales consulting is just like talking like you and I are right now. I don't have any expectations. I want to find out what they need. Can we help them? Is it a waste of my time? Is it a waste of their time? So, I mean, I, I, I sold some highly technical stuff and dealt with companies that would only buy from a few people. I wasn't selling insurance or cars or stuff like that. I mean, I couldn't do that. Uh, so, you know, I, I studied a lot, I studied many of courses uh, in sales and studied personalities and learned to identify personality types, body language, uh, and, and moderate pitch and tonality, depending on who I'm speaking with, which is something really hard to do in my personal life, but it's easy to do professionally. And so I enjoyed it. But, you know, after 20 years of, of people just not trusting you because you're a salesperson, sure. it, you know, it's, it's kind of about as fun as being a dentist, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like I said, I'm burnt out on it. I'm just like, you know, I could do it again for the right company. But, you know, it, I did I always did better when I was spending most of my time talking to design engineers, thermal engineers, mechanical engineers, because I have an engineering background and we talk about right. engineering stuff. And I wasn't going, ooh, you know, this semiconductor's got sparkles on it. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, you need sure. to buy this, you know. And so, but, you know, whenever I tell anyone, especially women, oh, I'm in sales, they go, ah, 
I yeah. cringe a little. Well, it's the same you know? thing. Like nobody, I'm lucky because nobody knows what rhetoric is. So when they hear me say I'm a rhetorician, like they're <laughs> like, what, what the hell is that? And then I'm like, well, it's persuasion. You know, I've got a PhD in persuasion. And then they start to get nervous. They're like, are you going to manipulate me? I said, did I say I'm going to manipulate you? Did I say PhD in manipulation? I said persuasion. And again, this one of why I distinguish very clearly about, I teach ethical persuasion because you can be uh -huh. incredibly effective with ethical persuasion, which is what you're talking about, that you're there to give uh -huh. them the information they need to make a good decision about whether to buy this thing or not. And right. that's ethical, giving out information so they can make a good decision is an ethical type of communication, even though it's persuasive, right. you know? Sure, sure. You know, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, everything you said, but I mean, I it's got to a Zen state in my career that it was no longer cared about the commission. I didn't want anyone to be angry with me post sale. Right. That's a lot. Anyone have, to me, that's, and you want to have buyer's remorse and go bad persuasion, and, oh. right? Like if, if you ruin the relationship, if they're not happy with what happened, then you were a bad persuader. Right. Right. Well, I guess you could say that. I guess I'm taking the word persuasion uh, as more in line with or uh, parallel to manipulation. Um, but yes, I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm definitely a persuasive salesperson. Yes. People seem to like me. So, yeah. <laughs> so tell me more. I'm so curious. You've got a PhD in rhetoric. Tell me about your certificates. Do you have some plaques on the wall? Have you framed some things? What do you mean when you say you have a PhD in rhetoric? Uh, are you questioning like uh, what rhetoric is, like what that actual academic program? No, is? I'm, I'm, I'm questioning your credentials. Where did which, which major university did you achieve a PhD in rhetoric from? Well, rhetoric, my friend, is uh, <laughs> one of the oldest academic areas there is. Like the Greeks taught rhetoric as part of their trivium. The base three base things that you took were rhetoric, grammar, and uh, logic. And you had mm -hmm. to pass those before you could go into the higher order uh, education. And so rhetoric's been around for a long time. It got submerged into marketing and advertising and, you know, political science and things like that. But rhetoric uh, has a huge tradition in academics. University of Texas at Austin is easily top 10, maybe top five in rhetoric programs. Uh, in really? The, yeah. So I could enroll and take a class at University of Texas in rhetoric. Absolutely. You could take... There's probably 50 classes over there in rhetoric. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's, you see how ignorant I am. Well, everybody is. It's not one of the, the major things that people get taught anymore. We never get taught about persuasion. Like, I, you know, you said you did a bunch of uh, courses and did some self-teaching and things like that to increase your sales effectiveness. That's rhetoric. It's just very focused on a, a very particular type of persuasion, which is in business. You're absolutely right. So, you know, people take political science, like even lawyers don't get trained in rhetoric, which makes no sense because they're arguing things for a living. And rhetoric uh -huh. is sort of the 2,500 year history of like all the great techniques that have been developed and then abstracted out so you can learn that stuff. Uh -huh. But yes, my degree is, I went to University of Texas uh, for my master's degree. And then I went to University of South Florida for my PhD. And my PhD actually has Jeb Bush signed on it because he was the governor back then how much do you love that yeah it's pretty funny to have uh jeb jeb bush decided i was academically qualified <laughs> so uh what what types of uh what types of jobs does someone get with a phd in rhetoric do well, you teach yourself today i mean i mean i know you teach in a roundabout way but do you teach formal classes I was a professor for almost 20 years, so uh, rhetoric professors teach communication courses. It's within general communication studies uh, departments, rhetoric is taught. Rhetoric is typically more uh, about public communication. It's a study of effective public communication, so it comes from the history of speeches, like studying how people speak in public, and now it's everything. It's TV, it's film, it's anything that's a public message rhetoricians will study. You know, I had no idea this about you, and it's amazing that uh, you, well, you just don't show your cards, I guess. You're a pretty good poker player. Known you for years, but I had no idea you were a professor for 20 years. No yeah. idea. Yeah, it was a thing. 
I, I did that yeah. for a long time. I was always running both careers. I was doing stand up. I started as a professor after I got my master's degree when I was 24 at the University of Louisville, started teaching and I started doing stand up at the same time. So I ran both both careers concurrently. But rhetoric, you know, is this sort of really interesting trove of techniques and strategies and theories that nobody ever yeah. accesses. So, yeah, I, I had a formal training for public speaking uh, that, you know, big software company paid for. And I, I've, I've uh, given technical conferences to groups as large as like 120 people. And then, you know, for a while, I was doing a 20 to 30 people a week every couple days. And just basically, a lot of it is crowd control, you know, mm -hmm. same things they teach you in stand up, like how do you handle a heckler? Involve them, get them into the program, ask them a direct question, shut them down, you know? And so that's a lot of the stuff you're talking about, I believe. Yeah. And there's, you know, human beings have to influence each other and we have to do public communication. So we learn it. We just do it through informal systems versus like formal traditions and rhetoric. So you hmm. learn pieces of it instead of kind of the whole thing. Marketing pulls out some of it and sales training pulls out some of it, but not the whole thing. That's why, you know, I taught, like I said, rhetoric courses and speech writing and speech analysis and TV writing and all these things for years. And I got tired of the university. Like the university is not the right environment for me. Like it's a tough job. And then the last one, the last few years, I've wanted to go back and rescue that stuff and turn it into courses to teach to, you know, actual human beings instead of 18 year olds. Oh, OK. So, OK, I was going to ask you, tell me why it's a tough job. I didn't know if it was the uh, the, the politics of the university and your uh, colleagues and or is it was it because of you dealing with 18 year olds? It's all of it. It's really four jobs. Like there's the teaching, which I love to love dealing with information, doing public performance. So that was great. But then it's grading and grading is horrific. Like it's the worst. <laughs> it's, worse terrible it's, just a task. it's a task you don't want to do. Well, it's reading their stuff and that's horrible because, you know, they're learning kind of. Yeah. So like you're up here and you study this stuff all the time and then you're reading it down here and you're like, oh my yeah. God, you're killing me. Yeah. And then they yeah. get very litigious and very upset about their grades because it ties into their lives. And that's not fair right. to them. It affects their lives. So you become in well, conflict with your students. That's right. That's ridiculous. Yes. There were a couple of occasions I went to my English teacher and protested my grade. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Well, I mean, uh, I guess I intimidated them because I got a better grade when I left. I started with a C minus and left with a B plus. So, I mean, uh, maybe because I was bigger than him or I was direct and forceful. Who knows? Uh, well, you, you know, know the reason? You want to know the professor reason? Get you out of get the student out of my way so I can go on with my life. Yep, it's easier. It's easier just to give them the grade. Like, why yeah. deal with this? Yeah. Well, I guess you uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Yeah, or the squeaky wheel gets replaced. That's my favorite version of that. <laughs> gets replaced? Are you talking about uh, firing people who complain all the time? Well, you know, you, you said this early in this conversation, you know, like um, wanting a business guy to get into politics and sort of run the society from a governmental perspective. The problem is like a lot of the business concepts don't really apply in societies very well. Like you can't fire people from the society. Right. It's like a family. You don't get to fire people from your family. They don't just disappear and go get another job or another family. There's some business principles that work very well within the idea of government, I think, and some that don't work very well at all. Like are, getting are rid of people saying, problem. Getting are you saying are you saying firing your staff members because they're not uh, performing up to your expectations is something you shouldn't do? No, I think you always have to have that option, but firing them because you know you have a whim. Uh, and they're not loyal enough to you is, yeah, yeah. is not particularly a good strategy. It seems yeah. to me. Hmm. It's nice to have that power if you want kind of emperor power, but you know, that you're fired thing that Trump was allowed to do for 10 years on TV or whatever didn't translate uh -huh. that well to politics. It seemed like. No, no, he, he uh, 
He did expect a lot, and he had good people around him that he let go or fired and ran off. You know, and uh, an attorney ge uh, general Barr is one of them who's you know basically didn't like him and didn't want to deal with him and hated it. But he, he but he took the job because he wanted the job and he thought he could do it fairly. So you know, I respect him for that. I respect the ones that stood up to him. You know. I mean, how do you yeah, think you would have done with Trump? If you were working with Trump, how do you think you would have oh, done? Yeah, well, see, when I was in project management, uh, my boss told me you should apply. They're, they're have, they had an open audition casting call in Austin. He said, you should go do that. You're a project manager. In every job, they have a project manager. And I said, that dude would fire me in the first week. There's no way I'm going through this bullshit. He sees people crying and all this stuff. And he'd sit across the table and go, you're fired. You know, I'd probably leap across the table and punch him on just <laughs> for the effect, you know. And he had, I think he had one of his sons on the show, too. I don't know if it was Eric or, or uh, Trump Jr. or whatever. Uh, yeah, and I mean, remember that. that at the show, it was horrible. But I mean, you know, the, the, the jobs they gave them were pretty difficult to do. They were all sales and marketing jobs. They really didn't have anything to do with project management. They said someone's a project manager, someone's the leader. They should have just said, you know, you're the you're the marketing manager. It really didn't make much sense to me. I thought the show was horrific. I did watch it out of curiosity, but there's no way I went on beyond that. No. So you couldn't have worked with Trump, but you no. would vote, but you would vote for him. I didn't vote for him. But would you vote for him? You seem to be like you like you don't seem anti-Trump. Uh, I, 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 I see what the, th what the things I point out is what I point out in my, all my political posts when they get political is hypocrisy. All right. I mean, the, the liberal media is owned by the democratic party. Yeah, they well, will, never okay. Said, so let's, I'm going to pull you back to that in a minute. We don't have to do it right now, okay, but that okay. again, you know, choosing your terms and defining them and then, and then a claim. And is it true? Sure, sure. Like sure, liberal no media problem. is a crazy term that everybody has somehow adopted. And I'm like, okay, well, okay. okay, so, so go back, you know, keep going. Yeah, well, I mean, so yeah, I think you threw me off my mark there with that. You know, I mean, like uh, Obama, oh, I just saw. I said Obama. you're not anti-Trump and you were starting to talk about that. Yeah. Um, I think he had a lot of flaws. I'm glad it wasn't Hillary. I think he did a lot of good things to reposition the United States strength as far as trade relations. He wasn't afraid to go meet with Russia. He wasn't go afraid to go meet with, uh, with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. You know, he had balls. And, you know, and you, everybody thought he's going to start a war. He's going to go there and start a war. Well, you know, he goes and meets with the little short guy from Korea, and then they stop doing missile testing. Okay, I mean, you know, the guy's a negotiator. You know, he comes off real brash on tv but they say when he's in a meeting he's actually you know pretty nice guy and pretty decent you don't see that though okay so you know abc nbc cbs mn mn msnbc <laughs> hln cnn you know uh you got google you got twitter they're all they're all saying he's a horrible person and obama says if you watch uh, fox you are living on another planet okay so, you know, I've, I've got a theory, you know, there's, there's this old saying that uh, if you're young and you're not a Democrat, you have no heart. And if you're old and you're a Democrat, you have no brain, right? I think liberals make decisions from a place of feeling from emotion. I think conservatives make decisions from, uh, based on facts. I'll go a little step further, just my general observation. I believe there's a larger preponderance of uh, conservatives that have bachelor of science degrees. And, and there's also inversely a larger preponderance of liberals who have a bachelor of arts degrees. If more people studied math and science, I wouldn't have to listen to so many stupid man-made climate change conversations. You know, that's how I feel about it. I hate explaining stuff to my friends all the time. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. All that. Wonderful. I, I love it. I think all that is a very, you know, common way of, of understanding like the difference between conservatives and, you know, liberals. I, I think those are very, you stated them very well. My, my term, I'm going to come back and pull out on you is facts. Okay. So bachelor of science, and I know tons of engineers. I started out as an engineer and I've worked in technical fields a lot doing marketing and things like that. 
and I know what the engineering mind is like. It really likes to hold on, you know, before it makes a judgment, before it goes with, you know, the dominant way of looking at things or public opinion or the heart or anything else. It wants information. Right. You know, and I think that's, right. I think that's a really, you know, viable way of looking at the world is let's, let's look at facts before we make our decisions. So the question is, can you get to facts from sort of media, no matter what the media is? so that you can enact that policy. And I hear a lot of conservatives will say things like you, you've pulled out, you know, different facts along the way about like uh, what, what you just did about um, Obama versus, you know, Hillary versus this, and you'll hit me with a fact or like climate science. Uh -huh. And you clearly have some derision towards man-made cli climate science, right? Uh -huh. At least uh -huh. that's what you communicated to me. Uh -huh. So, you know, I'm like, okay, well, you got to give me like real facts. Like, do you study climate science? If you're going to use that system on me, because I would love to know what the actual answers are. Okay. All right. Uh, well, the, the standing number from scientists since uh, 1990 is that 90% of greenhouse gases are contributed by naturally uh, happening volcanic activity. That would mean 10% is man-made. Okay. Um, so to think that, oh, we only have 12 years left to live on this earth. I think we're ants on, we're fleas on a dog's ass. I think the world's going to survive without us. Could we do better? Yes. Uh, shutting down the Keystone pipeline. Well, isn't that kind of just uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face? I mean, now we're going to transport oil through tanker trucks on the highway or trains, and both those burn fossil fuels to transport. The pipeline did not burn fossil fuels to transport it. So it seems like uh, this, the, you know, both, both parties always have their three things. And, and, and on the Democratic Party, it's, it's climate change is a big scare. It's get people scared. It's a great motivator in rhetoric to believe that uh, we need to do something fast or we're all gonna die. And so, you know, but canceling that project and putting 16,000 people out of work halfway through the project, is that really helping the Green Party in any way? Okay, so let me, let me slow you a little bit. So we're trying to do facts right now because we're trying to do science-based decisions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you just talked about it, like doing fear rhetoric and pushing people to positions through fear. Nobody really likes that idea. That's an unethical persuasion technique. You know, and you hear a lot of people call that out. So let's not use fear to do our politics and let's use facts to do our politics. So what I'm asking like you, like, yes, I think everybody would love to do science based politics. So climate change, you know, you pulled out this 90 percent versus 10 percent. That's a very distinct set of numbers and engineers mm -hmm. love numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. That's how they make right. their decisions. Well, where did that come mm -hmm. from? What does that actually mean? Like, do you study well, climate science? Where did do you I study? No, where did I get it? I, it's been it's been a reported number by scientists. Like I said, I've heard first time I heard it was 1990. Yeah. So but, I've been hearing that same number. But I have all that stuff in my head too. Like that that it's yeah. come from somewhere, and I kind of remember it and all that. But I have no idea whether it's true, and I have no idea what the source is or anything else. So that's not mm -hmm. science. That's not fact. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the the uh, ping pong back onto your side of the table. What percentage of global warming do you believe is man made? Four hundred. Do you have any science to back it up? Four hundred and twelve percent. That's funny. So I mean, do you have a real answer? Yeah, that's my belief. Like every single molecule of climate change is man-made. That's my belief, because I know nothing about it. Okay, oh, that's interesting. So um, do you believe the earth is, uh, is just completely stagnant and, and humankind is the only thing that influences uh, climate change uh, and waves and uh, tidal waves and forest fires. And I mean, do you believe this all contributed by man? 
Now, I, I'll give you the real answer. I believe it's an incredibly complex system. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I don't know anything about it. Mm, okay. Like cow farts, right? That was a, a thing because cows are eating grain instead of grass and therefore more methane. And then that's, you know, methane is particularly bad for the environment. Right. I've heard this. Is that true? Yes. I have no idea. Uh, is it a contributor? Yes. But the thing is, what's the percentage? You know, and AOC wants to ban, you know, the cattle industry, but she's also a vegan too. So she's got a, you know, a bias. Yeah, it's her carrots are going to kill us. I think it's the carrots. <laughs> well, cattle are raised in a very unethical manner, and we probably should be eating less meat. We should, and, and <laughs> Don't be so many really cows. Yeah. So I, I like my point is, and this is, you know, I think one of our issues in our politics is that we have such complicated systems. And we're thinking people, a lot of people thinking, and I think you're exactly right. I think there are a lot of conservatives are more science, bachelor of science people, and they're looking for, you know, better answers than sort of emotional, uh, emotionally driven rhetoric. You know, it doesn't right. work on them, right? Uh -huh. They're like, I, you know, quit hitting me with your feel sorry for this or feel sorry for that. I, I don't care. I want to know what the actual numbers are. And I think if we could well, do that, we would probably be okay if we could get real information. But media doesn't right. give you real information. No, it doesn't. On it doesn't. Any side, if, anywhere. And if you Google it anywhere, you know, you'll you'll look up five sources that tell me they'll say that Paul's absolutely wrong that volcanoes contribute ninety percent of greenhouse gases. And I'll look up five sources that say I'm right. And you're going to go, well, which one do we choose? And you'll fact check it, or I'll fact check it. And depending on which site you go to, you can get a different answer because Google is. A, Google's writing their own definitions of words now. If you Google a word, instead of your first option, it's not Merriam-Webster, right? It's not the okay. Oxford Dictionary. It's Google's answer, and you read it and go, <laughs> that doesn't look like the last definition I read in a dictionary. I've got a dictionary from 30 years ago, and I can look at that and go, well, how'd that change so much? And it seems politically manipulated, right? Well, it's we in a, in one way. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think we what we're all realizing is that we're living in a world that's very different. All of our information is incredibly squishy. Yes. I, I, yeah. Look, I've got geologists in my family. I had to study geology as part of my uh, work as a oil field engineer for Halliburton. Uh, you know, I've gotten, I've gotten information from my brother-in-law who studies this stuff quite a bit. Now, he tells me Climate change is being exaggerated because you're not measuring enough data. They're looking at 50 year snapshots and not totally you know, possible. hundreds of year snapshots. Totally possible. Right. So, so, you know what? I, I trust someone who has a master's degree and has done it for 25 years. I don't feel like I need to go study climate change myself. All right. I think I can listen to a number of sets of data and go, well, all those seem to line up and maybe there's some truth there. All right? right. But that is. Reverses Versus AOC saying we've got 12 years or the earth's going to be over with. And there's some little girl in New Zealand crying on the video. What was her name? <laughs> Poor little girl is crying. Greta Thunberg? Her... Was that her? Was that yeah, the Nordic the Nordic woman? Nordic yeah, girl? yeah. Yeah, poor well, girl. Yeah. And... So there you go. There's there's rhetoric manipulating a young mind. Yeah, she's, absolutely. She's going to you die. Know, you, want a, you want a good crying 12-year-old uh, on your side. That's very effective. <laughs> Much more effective than, you know, some guy sitting up there with his graphs and his numbers. So the question yeah. is, like, how do we operate in the squishy times? Like, you're a smart person. You're like, okay, I know this guy, and I've kind of listened to him, and it makes sense to me much more so than, you know, a politician from Brooklyn sitting here and, you know, being very upset about things and doing hyperbole. And so you make a decision based on it. But it's still a bad decision. It's a bad decision system because it's squishy information. And okay. like no engineer is going to say, you know, I'm going to build this bridge and I'm going to kind of trust this guy who, you know, sort of builds bridges. And, and then my family's going to drive over that bridge day one. I, I think uh, that's reaching I engineers. <laughs> I don't think engineers uh, act that way and they wouldn't and they wouldn't have they would ruin their fucking career, obviously. 
But uh, but again, you know, while we're talking about it, you know, the new green deal, yeah, renewable energy, yes. I mean, every time I drive to New Mexico to see my sister, windmill farms in San Angelo and up through Lubbock and the Panhandle, love them, right? The fact is they take three and a half years to make pay themselves off and make it profitable. The fact is they snow fell, snow froze them up and they contributed nothing during this Texas freeze, right? I don't know, man. Now, you're you're still you're hitting me with you know claims and facts that I can't I can't know whether these are true or not. They contribute a small amount to the grid so far. Now, uh, water energy, wave uh, generation, that's a new thing. Why do we not have more hydroelectric dams? We used to have more. Why, why are we cutting down on those? I think all, anything renewable is great, but turning off a pipeline right now is not a good idea because gas prices are just going to go yeah, see, up. Now we you're still... dragging me over to pipelines. I don't know shit about pipelines either. You know, you well, had me up in the atmosphere. Yeah, in, okay. You know, the entire so, history of the planet. So I'm saying, I'm saying until we have sustainable energy that works and can supply the entire grid, you don't cut off a major artery that's going to put everybody in a lurch. So my point that doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I agree. Like, who would say, who, who, what rational person would say, yeah, get rid of all our energy and just rely on this, you know, uh, sketchy, you know, windmill? Nobody's going to want that. You know, that's a bad idea. And so the question again, like for me as a rhetorician, is to go back to the big picture of how do people make political decisions in an age of squishy information. It's really challenging, you know? It's, it's well, I think, you know, <laughs> they've done a very good job of the two-party system, and that's why I vote you know, independent and boycott. I mean, you know, Texas is going to turn blue. We're going to get enough immigrants into Texas, and it's going to turn blue. Uh, they say, they say, and you know, you don't know who they are. And so this is legal fact. Californians legal. We got to make yeah. it illegal to move here from California. And then they have to sneak in. Uh, no, they didn't do much for the housing market in Austin. That's for oh, sure. God. I, but, uh, I moved here right at the beginning of that boom. If I would just, and I bought a house that got, you know, swept away in a divorce, but I watch, you know, I look what it, what I paid for it and what it is now. And I'm like, ah, oh, that hurts. That hurts. Uh, was that the, was that the house I moved you into up above one eighty three? No, that was a different than uh, I was. I used to have a house in Crestview, right down by twenty two twenty two, across from Macau. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah, that must hurt. Yeah, that's like two three hundred thousand dollars more in that house right now than you know. So, oh well, yeah. what can you do? Well, hey man, I'm gonna cut uh, cut us off because we're uh, well over an hour, uh, and I okay. really appreciate your time. You know, it's always super fun to uh, kind of talk to you about things in general, but, you know, jump in and talk politics and I, I like it. Well, I hope you did learn something. I did. <laughs> I did. I've changed my mind about many things based on, yeah. my, based on your yeah. perspectives. Yeah, so, okay. Well, listen, uh, I cut this off and I got a few comments for you afterwards. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do that. So let me close up here. Hey, once again, everybody, thanks. Uh, any, anything you need to promote or anybody want to give uh, you a job in Colorado? You want to give Paul a job in Colorado, anybody? Anybody in project management, like somebody wants to work in the field, is technically has technical aptitude and will argue with you about anything. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's on his business card. I will argue with you about anything, but I have technical aptitude. That's Paul Sontag, everybody. Hey, uh, come back and see us again on Rhetoric Warriors. Uh, pop over and take a course. I'm just about to release a new course in the top 21 things you have to know to persuade anybody about anything. And um, learn some stuff about rhetoric. It's going to help you in life. It's going to make us a better country. And you'll even sell more stuff. There, there's the pitch. I'll see you again next time.